I would that you would turn with me to St. Matthew's Gospel, uh, chapter 1. And I would like to look at the verse, beginning at verse 18 and reading through and including verse 23, uh, to remain textual and to uh, add another dimension to the presentation of Jesus. I would like to check the responses to him in chapter 2 of St. Matthew's Gospel. I'll just read just a few uh, isolated parts of that. <clears throat> in St. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 1, uh, verse 18, Now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise, when as his mother Mary was espoused to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. Now, a couple of things critical here to me, and that is, uh, well, then Joseph, her husband, being a just man, not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privately. Now, uh, being a just man didn't mean that he wasn't angry. <laughs> and, and probably very confused uh, because he's engaged to uh, this lady and uh, obviously she's going to become his wife and and she comes up uh, uh, pregnant and uh, he didn't have anything to do with it. <laughs> Amen. Now that would make some real angry people in South Central LA. <laughs> A whole lot of folk anywhere in the world for that matter some folk would be real upset about that and uh, and being a just man and not willing to make a public example he decided to put her away as quietly as he could uh, it's interesting that uh, the Holy Ghost did this to uh, Joseph and uh, the Holy Ghost didn't speak to him about it beforehand it's, it's interesting that God didn't ask Joseph's permission to uh, get involved with his wife to be but the Holy Spirit just simply by the move of God impregnated her from the inside and then uh, in verse 20 now while he thought on these things I told you it wasn't just as easy as you thought it was he, he was thinking on these things and the Spirit of God did not come to him prior to but God allowed him the human uh, machinations of his emotion and his intellect and God did not uh, come to him prior to. God just allowed him to have to deal with the issue. And then of course, uh, the Lord did save him this though. The Lord did spare him uh, to have to have her tell him uh, that she was having a baby by God. I mean. Uh, that would have been another thing for him to have to believe uh, that it was, in, you know, because it never happened before and now I'm in this situation and you're going to tell me that this is how these things happen. But the spirit of the Lord, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream. So now he still got to deal with a dream. Uh, can you imagine now the answer to the dilemma of your fiance being pregnant? Uh, you get that in a dream. Uh, uh, I, maybe I'm dyslectic, but uh, there's a lot of problems this would cause a whole lot of folk. You're all sitting here looking like Alice in Wonderland. Uh, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee. Now the dream says, go ahead and take her as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus. For he shall save his people from their sins. Now all this was done that it might be fulfilled which was spoken of by the Lord, by the prophet saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child and shall bring forth a son. And they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. Now there is absolutely no way for such a miracle thing to take place and there not be controversy there's absolutely no way you cannot be that blessed and somebody doesn't despise it you can't be as powerful as Jesus 
entering the world in such a miraculous way and there's not opposition. So in chapter two, we get another look at the human nature. And in chapter one, what we see is God coming into the world. In chapter two, we get reaction. Anytime something marvelous happens in your life, there will be a reaction. The reaction now is when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judah, in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem, uh, saying, Where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen a star in the east and are come to worship him. When Herod the king had heard these things, he was troubled and all Jerusalem with him. The people who should have been glad were troubled. The people who were aliens were glad. The people who were outside of the religious circle were glad. The people who were inside the religious circle were mad. Amen. The killers were inside. Amen. Uh, 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 verse 13, uh, they departed another way. Uh, then the reason they depart another way, uh, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream, saying, Now you take the child out and flee to Egypt, for Herod will seek the young child to destroy him. Oh, God, immediately upon the coming of Christ, there is controversy. The lines are drawn. It's either you worship him or you destroy him. Amen. And look at your neighbor and say, Thou shalt call his name Jesus. Look at somebody and say, Jesus is his name. I, I, I propose to approach the text particularly because of the time, not only in which we live, but the time of the year. Because now the year is laced with the historical event that changed the world. And this is the advent or the coming of Christ. I could begin in a traditional manner and simply uh, do what is usually done with the narrative of the first advent of Christ and just deal with the story. Or we can dissect the theological implications of the event uh, with a view to making the event pertinent to our time. I, I, I am not just trying to tell a story. Uh, I need the significance of the Christ event as it relates to me and my time. Uh, it's been argued that the religious question of our day is, is not so much who is God. The question has now become, uh, what is man? You see, uh, we are now moving from the mystical, intellectual, philosophical theology, and we're trying to become pragmatists. We're trying to take what is given to us and use it to live on an everyday basis. Uh, I, I don't just stop by here to pass the time on a Sunday or because it's a traditional thing to do, I am seeking biblical information to help me to get through each day of my life. Uh, we, we, yes, yes, we continue to wonder, and we do, we, we continue to wonder, uh, actually, is there a God in heaven, and, and rightfully so, yet almost uh, with the same persistence, we are asking, is there humanity on earth? Uh, I, I was far away in Tortola when I got word that uh, 17 people were shot even in the community. And, and, and one lady from this church, one of our members, was shot in her foot, in her leg, and it kept the bullet from uh, killing her child who was in her other arm uh, on the other side of her. And, uh, and, and in the middle of that kind of calamitous and despicable behavior, the question has to come from the heavens back onto the earth. And we begin to ask ourselves, is there any humanity on earth? 
uh, one writer uh, puts it this way. He said, the question now is not so much, is there life after death? He says, the question has become, is there life before death? And many of us often look at that and we ourselves, particularly at my age, that's a little verbose, at my age, we begin to wonder what is this all about this thing called life? Uh, from one trial to the other, from one battle to the other, from one heartbreak to the other, from one disappointment to the other. And if you're not careful, you would become extraordinarily cynical and skeptical about this thing called life. Just as soon as you think you have your thing together, it falls apart. I, I, I was telling somebody the other day, just as soon as you learn how to live and the sophistication that goes with life, then it's time to check out. Uh, it's, it's interesting. The, the, this thing called life. Everybody is preoccupied with getting in touch with God so that they might live wonderfully hereafter. But the question now is, is there life before death? When you deal with the issues of the land, you deal with the political issues, you deal with the terrorist systems and the hatred. And it's really funny that we as a group of people, as humanity, we've mastered technology. We've done everything in terms of communicative systems. I was, as we were pulling out of uh, uh, Miami, the pilot said to us, look on the right side. And I looked out on the right side and the shuttle was coming off the ground at Cape Canaveral and it was heading, I saw it as it was going up, a once in a lifetime moment, flying and looking out and seeing going and with all of that. And you wonder with all of the technology and the world phones and all the things we have, the computers and the televisions and everybody's life is in our living room and the newspapers and all of that and we put together a system that is marvelous but still we can't even talk to each other uh, yeah, you wonder you wonder about this thing called life uh, uh, professor Bruner puts it this way he, he said and I quote it is frequently and too confidently said in theological circles that Luther's 16th century question, how can I find a gracious God, has actually been replaced in our time by another question, what is the meaning of life? Uh, there's no doubt in my mind that when you walk into a church house today, uh, you have to ask the modern reality question which seems to replace the, uh, or could be another name for the God question because if I can understand or find God, I should be able to understand and find my life because yes, I've been having a whole lot of experiences without meaning. I've been going from this to the other, to the other, to the other and all it does is just adds issues and more disappointment and so somewhere in all of my life I I have got to find the meaning. Well, Matthew projects that the meaning of life is found in the face of Jesus Christ. Ah, oh, that's what Matthew is indicating here. He is saying now, if we can just get God in the world, then of course, it will give us a meaning to live. Uh, I cannot just be connected to God for getting out of here. I need to be connected to God in here. <laughs> I hope you see where I'm going. I, I need to have a relationship with God that gives my life some substance. And I just don't want to be another person living another life. Then when it's over, nobody knew I was here. I want to meet God. the World Council of Churches. I looked at the Catholics and, uh, and their conceptualization of what I'm talking about. And, and what 
what has happened is they are redrafting the doctrine of, hu of the human person. The first half of their concern is what is the human person? And the second half of the draft is what are the major problems that modern man has? And is Jesus just as relevant to my today problem as he was to their problem? Here's what Karl Barth said. He said, since God came into the world and became a human being, he said, now man is the measure of all things. Ah, this is why when Jesus comes into the world, uh, the camp divides because you can't face him and he not upset the way you have been living. Oh, I feel God here. When Jesus comes, it changes your perspective. It changes your attitude and your disposition. It changes how you feel about who you are. And once you change how you feel about who you are, you divide your camp. Everybody who was with you before you knew who you are doesn't always stay with you after you find out who you are. Uh, I feel God. And, and when he comes into my world, it's either I'm sucked into him through an amicable, worshipful disposition, or I become diabolically opposed to him because I can't stand what he wants from me. Uh, are you willing to take the step into real life? I know you're ready for afterlife, but the question is not the afterlife. The question is the present life. And I'm not in this church just because I'm trying to go to heaven. I'm trying to live an overcoming life right here. Oh, I feel God. It was is, is this in mind that Matthew now brings me and he highlights this message in chapter 2 because it proves as long as you are in the shadows uh, there is no measure of who you are because now the measure of who you are is going to be seen in your ability to deal with the contrary forces to who and what your purposes are. You never have any contrary winds when you're not trying to get somewhere. Everybody in here who is just flowing with the tide, well, you'll let something else determine where you go. But when Jesus comes in, he divides people from the careless, indifferent, going nowhere to those who are intending to latch hold to him and pull themselves into significance in this life. Jesus didn't rise for you to go down and burn and crash. He came into this world so that you'd rise up out of the ashes and tell the world you no longer move me but I move you because I'm a changer. I feel it in here. Uh, give somebody a high five and say I'll never be the same after today. Amen. When Jesus comes into my life he changes my thinking. I quit the camp and I go to can. I quit if it's comfortable and I go to if it's possible. I feel like preaching today. I, I, I don't sit around waiting for somebody to do it for me. When Jesus comes. Uh, uh, bless the Lord. It, it is here now that your exposure, you see, because as long as Jesus was not around, you were just one of the group. But now that Jesus shows up and now he exposes you because he comes in you to expose you. And the exposure brings uh, contrary or contradictory responses. There are those who like the fact that you are the salt of the earth, that you are the light of the world kind of character. And some people will use your light in order to move to the next level. But there are others who would like to put your light out. Oh, I feel the Holy Spirit. Anyhow, it's critical though to understand this because there is a light of the world impact 
right that every child of God will have because once you come into contact with the Lord he's going to move your thinking above the average he's going to move your level of faith above the average he's going to move your desire for purpose above the average he's going to move your desire for excellence above the average you can't walk with Christ in mediocrity you got to fix everything around you to suit who you have become oh I feel the Holy Spirit here somebody's gonna break out it's critical here because the acceptance or rejection only comes with the exposure as long as Jesus was safely tucked in the bosom of God in the far regions of an eternal heaven there was no hatred of this sort but all of a sudden when he shows up now people take sides I feel it here the Bible said he came unto his own and they received him not but the revelation of God in Christ is significant for the world to hold itself together but as many as received him to them gave he power to become the children of God oh, the Greek aorist tense is used it's aorist indicative uh, of Lombano and it means as many as did receive him as many as had the nerve to say he might be different from what I've seen but I'll take him he might be a little bit more demonstrative than I've seen but I'll take him he seems to be a different sort but I'll take him because I was never regular anyway I was just waiting for the opportunity to become a son of victory oh I feel it in here I'm talking to somebody touch somebody beside you and say I was never the usual anyway uh, touch your neighbor and say yeah there's something unusual about you amen you got to learn to walk in the exceptional action of a disciple believer of Christ uh, the dative case explainer explaining the relative character is to them to everyone who receives to them he says you give me something I'll give you something you accept me and I'll give you some power I'm not asking you to be me I'm just saying accept me and I'll put in you the power to be me uh, I feel it here I'm not asking you to imitate me uh, because I will duplicate myself in you just receive me let me tell you something about folk who receive the word they don't act like they used to they don't talk like they used to and they don't take defeat like everybody else because I've got a word from the Lord receive him I pray it is here now that he gives the right and the right becomes uh, Edokan, the right. And he talks about now the indicative of Didomai, the right. I don't need to go so heavy. It means authority, but it includes power. I give you the right to be, become the son of God. It's your right. Touch your neighbor say, it's your right to be blessed. It's your right to be an overcomer. It's your right to have power it's your right to be somebody it's your right to tell the devil get out of your house it's your right to possess the things that God placed you here to possess he said if you receive me I'll give you the right to be who you ought to be it's your right to tell somebody get out of my face with your lying self it's your right I feel the power of God here. Uh, it's critical now to become. Because the right now is to become. And this is second era, it's middle now. And what it's saying is you have the right to become what you were not before. Oh, I feel like preaching in here. You've got the right to riches when you used to be poor. You've got the right to intelligence when you used to be ignorant. You've got the right to be blessed when you used to be cursed. You've got the right to be what you've never been before. And that is a son of the living God. 
I got a right, I got a right. It is a power here that God, in order just simply to receive him, touch your neighbor, say just receive him. And even them. And of course now to them that believe on his name. You've got to have a password in order to get through in this life. You've got to have a password. And if you don't know the password, you can't get to the next level. The password is J. Thou shalt call his name. It is critical to grasp this because now he is dealing with the common power that is given to those who can believe on his name. And this, of course, is Matthew chapter 2's very special theme because now he deals with the dual response of human beings as it look at the third human being, the Christ. Ah, God's self-revelation in Christ. I mean, it stirs down to the very spirit of a man. Oh, you can hurt me emotionally, but that does not mean you have reached my spirit. You can hurt me physically, but that does not mean you've got my spirit. But when Jesus shows up, oh, you can show up and I could look at you and, mm, you're beautiful, but you didn't get to my spirit. That was just pulpitude. But when Jesus shows up, he cuts to your spirit. It's either you're with him or you're against him, but you can't sit on the fence. Oh, I feel like preaching here. Oh, God help us in here. It is critical to grasp this because the self-revelation uh, has brought two different responses. There is the response of the Eastern Magi, uh, the, the wise men, and there is the bad response of Herod to the Christ child. One writer comments, and he puts it like this, he says, the scriptures aren't really concerned about the doctrine of man per se. For in the scriptures opinion there is really no man or woman rather what the scripture sees is human beings that are created in the image of God they're created actually to face and to relate responsibly to their God now notice the drift when there is no presentation from God there is no revelatory experience then I'm drifting in my own steam but all of a sudden here pops from heaven the child Christ Jesus so now I have to decide I wish you hadn't talked to me about God because now I'm having nightmares I wish you hadn't mentioned the Bible because now something is pricking my nerves because I just can't walk away from it as if it doesn't exist there are some people that God will put in your life that are so full of his anointing that you just can't bypass them. You might walk away but you still hear the words ringing in your spirit. God has you in a place where you've got to face Jesus Christ and he sets you up so that either you take him and be blessed or become a killer. I feel like preaching because if you don't take him you've got to hate him and you got to hate him you're gonna try to destroy people try to destroy you when God brings you to a place where they either have to decide that they got to get up from where they are and make some of their life or kill you because you did oh I feel the Holy Ghost can I preach like I feel it the Messiah then has to unveil because every Everything would have been fine if there was not a personal Christ because history in and of itself is impersonal and nature in and of itself is impersonal but when the Christ child appeared and sat in the middle of Bethlehem now it's personal touch your neighbor and say take it personally yes when God shows up somebody they better take it personally because when God gets in your business you got to do something about your life I feel like preaching in here Woo! 
Glory to God. Mm, I feel God. I can't sit here and be nothing when Jesus showed up. I can't sit here and feel like I can't make it when Jesus showed up. I can't sit here and feel like I'm not destined for something other than to be tossed to and fro by other people's whims. The devil is a liar. I'm here for a purpose to lay hold to the power of God and tell the devil get out of my house because I've got the right mm, I feel it in here uh, touch your neighbor say neighbor what's that name again uh, what's that name what's that name uh, do you know the password do you know I feel God in the house it is however the Messiah he unveils the true God he unveils him personally savingly and responsibly in nature and this now maintains the purity of the Old Testament message against idolatry because had he not come in a personal form he would just be another icon for man to idolize but he comes personally looks like a man walks like a man and the person of resurrection here the personal revelation rather totally defies the idolatry of man because the revelation is the work of the Holy Spirit can you go with me twice the Holy Spirit is mentioned in Matthew 1 18 through 20 the first place it is the one who brings the Jesus to Mary the Holy Spirit is the source of Jesus in Mary I hope you're with me don't lose me here the Holy Spirit then becomes the only one who brings Jesus to birth in people it is not Mary's initiative because Mary couldn't have thought to lay in a bed one night and impregnate herself I wish somebody talked to me it is God who took the initiative can I speak to you in here when God takes the initiative in your life let him do the miracle I feel, I feel like preaching here somebody need a miracle let God take over because when God takes over miracles happen in the beginning I feel the Holy Spirit in here I got to preach to the devil gets mad touch somebody and say I'll never be the same after this I'm a miracle child anyone who has Jesus alive in their spirit is a miracle because it's another virgin birth where the Lord just stepped in and gave you something that you couldn't have got yourself I feel I might as well have church I might as well lift him up it is the Holy Spirit then and it's always a miracle every time you come out of another trial it's a miracle every time you move and don't lose your mind it's a miracle every time the devil tried to stop you but couldn't phase you it's a miracle every time God moves you to another level it's a miracle but somebody said miracles happen around me every day because every time the Holy Ghost moves lifts teaches raises praise it's a miracle I feel I feel a little churchy in here shake somebody's hand like you're gonna shake it off and say neighbor what's that password I need the password I need the password I need the password I feel the Holy Spirit that's why the writer declared with man this is impossible but with God everything is possible it's possible for you to this week be blessed more than you ever have in your life it's possible for the contract to get signed for the money to roll in it's possible for cancer to be healed because I don't know what next the Holy Ghost will do but whatever you're gonna do Lord do it I 
perfume. I got to preach this thing. It is the centricity of Christ that is the power of the Holy Ghost. Because the Christ centricity of the Holy Spirit is therefore very earthly. Because it's bringing Christ into my situation. That's why Jesus declared when the Spirit came, it would bear witness of Him. He said, It will glorify, He will glorify me. He will take mine and declare it unto you. Then He said of us, When we receive the Spirit, ye shall be my witnesses. Whenever God comes into human life, He becomes the center of what we deal. And when He is the center of life your life is now just now worth living with Christ outside my life isn't worth anything so the revelation of Jesus is the revelation of salvation because the names of God are generally manifested in his works anytime you see him work you generally gave him a name when he moved in the scriptures on the, the back of Israel at Rephidim. You remember when they went to Rephidim and the Amalekites attacked them and they held up Moses' hands and they called the place Jehovah Nisi. It was something that God did that caused them to name the place. When uh, Abraham was about to kill his son Isaac and the ram came up in the bush. Abraham named the place Jehovah Jireh. When Israel had no righteousness and Ezekiel looked at their trials, he named that condition Jehovah Sikadu, the Lord our righteousness. They're struggling with confusion and Jeremiah called it Jehovah Shalom, the Lord is our peace. It was Jeremiah who needed the presence of the Lord so he called the place Jehovah Shammah the Lord is present it was David writing and looked at God as a shepherd and he called him Jehovah Rofa the Lord is my shepherd at Marah at bitter waters it was Moses who named the place Jehovah Rofika the Lord that healeth all that God ever did was show himself through his names, through his works. But here now we have Isus, which is the Hellenizing of the Hebrew Yeshua. Thou shalt call his name Isus, or you shall call him Yeshua. We know the name as Joshua, which is a shortening for Yehushua, and means Yahweh is the one that saves or simple language God saves here is a name that does not only define who Jesus is it also tell you what Jesus does God saves I feel the spirit of God in here God saves can I fix it just like I feel it when I say Jesus I say God saves when I say Jesus the car won't go off the road because God saves when I say Jesus I will not lose my life because God saves when I say Jesus my body is healed because God saves when I say Jesus the devil's got to get out of my face because God I feel a little church in here somebody touch your neighbor say neighbor what's that password tell him that password is God saves Jesus I feel like lifting him up here is the rare person whose name means exactly what it says God saves is not only his name it's his perfect definition if you seek to diminish God then he 
becomes just an exalted representative without the power to do anything. He wouldn't even be a son of God. He would just be a representative. Well, I'm a representative, but my name don't mean nothing. I got to call his name to give my name some meaning. If I don't call his name, the devil will wipe out my name. But when I said Jesus, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. I feel something pushing me here. Touch your neighbor said the password to a better life is Jesus. Jesus. Can I go the other side? If I went to the other side on the save and I reduced the save to say that Jesus is very helpful, that Jesus assists me with my problems, then I've just made God weak. If I take him from God, then I make the save weak. If I take down the save, then I make the God weak. I got to keep the God strong and I got to keep the save strong. Then I got Jesus. I feel like preaching in here. If thereby he does not utterly rescue me, he's got to utterly liberate me. He's got to deeply and dramatically save me. Then the name is so diluted. He becomes a homoiosis, which is like God, rather than a homoosis, which is the very God. The name is invested with full powers and great significant because Jesus is the God who saves. So Matthew said when you call him, call him Jesus because he himself shall save you out of any situation you're in. I'm getting ready to close this thing. Give somebody a high five and say either you're a part of the solution or you are part of the problem but this year I'm coming out of problem into solution because I know the name above every name Jesus is the name I got to call when things are going against me that's one name the devil don't want to hear Jesus is the name I got to call when it looks like my checkbook is running on the E Jesus is the name I've got to call in order to have a good marriage Jesus is the name I got to call in order to get the job that they're trying to keep from me you can keep it from me but you can't keep it from Jesus so I'm coming over here with a mind made up that I will have the victory in the name of Jesus I wish somebody touched somebody and say do you know the way to a better life Jesus do you know the way to a bigger house Jesus do you know a way to a sane mind I will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on me do you know a way to drive the demons out of your job out of your house out of your children what's the password Jesus open the door for me Jesus make a way out of nowhere Jesus I need a miracle Jesus heal my body Jesus send me some joy Jesus send me some power Jesus help me to overcome Jesus help me to be what I've never been in my life Jesus I need your help Jesus turn it around where two or three agree in my name I am I feel victory in here cut some money some victory shall be mine I know who to call I don't call ghostbusters I call Jesus Jesus to drive the devil out of your life out of your pocketbook out of your house 
out of your job, out of your car. Jesus, we're ready for a blessing. Send. Somebody on the shoulder. Do you know the password? What's the password? Jesus. Woo! Thou shalt call. I had a baba motion. Woo! I know you in love. I know you've been in love, but your lover's name is not the same as when you holler Jesus. Woo. Susan, don't get it like that. Noel, don't move you like that. But oh, when you holler Jesus, Jesus, Woo. folk begin to look, folk begin to wonder what you're getting ready to do. Your neighbor said, Jesus, tell your neighbor, I'm getting ready to do something. I'm getting ready to break some yokes. I'm getting ready to get the devil out of my house. I'm getting ready to stop the generation curse. Jesus. Thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall say. Now we finally come to the meaning of life. And I do have an answer for the question. Is there life before death? And the answer is yes. Yes. I came that you might have life and have it more abundantly. I want you to get one person by both hands. Get one person by both hands. Your life will never be the same. Yehoshua. Mm -hmm. Jesus. Jesus. Joshua, Jesus, somebody needs to call that name over your children, Jesus, over your financial situation, through this bout with prostate cancer, through this fight with breast cancer, through these troubled times, through these difficult financial times. To the feelings of rejection, the feeling of confusion, God saves. He sent this word to encourage you. He sent this word to lift your spirit. All hope is not lost. There is still the miracle of the appearance of Jesus. The miracle of the appearance in your life orchestrated, initiated, and guided by the Holy Spirit in your life now is the power of a spirit that is so unbreakable that nothing Satan does can move it from its power. You are on the right track. For all he says, if you have enough power just to call this name, Jesus, for unto us a child is given. Jesus. 
Jesus is the meaning of our existence. Jesus is the reason for our season. And our season is as long as we call the name Jesus. Dear Father, I squeeze one hand. And I squeeze this in the name of Jesus. And I, I bind every spirit, oh God, of discouragement. I bind depression. I bind sadness and sorrow. I bind, Lord, anything that is self-destructive. I bind low self-esteem. I bind, Lord, any attitude that nullifies the gift that is in this person. I bind that drawback, that taciturn spirit, the declivity spirit. I, I bind it right now. And I pray, God, that you raise this person up. Squeeze the other hand. I loose an anointing that has never been felt in this life before I lose it into my brother, into my sister. I lose faith, great faith, mountain moving faith. I lose love right now. Love for self, love for the people around. I, 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 I lose joy. I lose ministry gifts in the name of Jesus. I lose it. I lose financial blessings. I, I lose it right now in the middle of an economy that we don't even know how to define. I lose now the power of your spirit for the joy of the Lord is my strength. And I claim my joy in the name of Jesus. Now loose those hands and everybody with a loud voice just holler the password. Jesus! Somebody God's calling you. Woo! I feel it here heavy. Listen, I want to educate the church. Uh, the church is not actually over until the benediction. And it's certainly not over before the altar call. Somebody here needs to come to the Lord now. You need to come now. You need to say, you know, I need deliverance. I need God to save me. I was so much in my life. I need him now. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on, man. Come on. They're shooting people randomly. I, I want to be saved. Backslider, come on home. Come on. You're not coming back to us. You're coming back to God. Come on. He's calling you. He's reaching for you. Oh, come on. Oh, come on. Hey. Come on, come on, come on. That's it, run down here. That's it. I want to be saved. The name of Jesus. There's no name given under heaven whereby, among men, whereby we must be saved. That's why we baptize in the name of Jesus. Because that's the saving name. 